Well, uh, next weekend is my 40th high school reunion. I graduated when I was nine, you know, one of those kids. <laughs> I'm not able to go for various reasons, but I did go 10 years ago to my 30th high school reunion. And can I just say, high school reunions are weird. How many of you have ever been to one? I don't think they're just weird. They're fun and wonderful, but they're, they're just weird. When I went back to my 30th, uh, because my family had moved when, we, uh, when I graduated that summer, I had not seen any of these classmates since the day we graduated. 30 years went by. So I spent the entire weekend with the strangest sensation that I was attending a masquerade party and that all these high school friends were just dressed up like old people. That's what it felt like the whole weekend. You know, my first desire when I saw an old classmate after 30 years was to say, what happened to your face? But I knew they were thinking the same thing about me, so we just sort of lied to each other all weekend. Hey, you're looking great, you know. Well, one of the other things I did when I was back home was just drive around to see the places that were important to me as a child. Home where our family grew up, uh, the church where my dad was pastor where I was baptized. Uh, drove around to see the schools I'd attended. And most of that stuff looked kind of like I remembered it. The trees were larger and stuff, but the places were the same. And then I decided to drive by the ball fields where my brother and I learned to play Little League Baseball. First two or three I drove by, it looked a lot the same. You could tell kids were still playing in those fields. But then I came to one field. And it was just in complete disrepair. You could tell kids no longer played on it. Weeds were everywhere. Couldn't even see where the bases had been. The backstop was all broken down and covered with vines. And it just made me kind of sad. I thought, that, that's, that's our field. That, that's where I hit a triple with the bases loaded when I was 11 to win a game. I still remember weird details like that. Anniversaries, not so much. But that detail, I got. <laughs> you know? That's where I had my 12th uh, birthday party with my buddies, and that was the day my dad got hit in the eye with a ball because he was catching without a mask, and we had to call my mom because he was bleeding all over the place. That was our field. That's my childhood. Now it was just sort of a useless weed patch. Well, today we go way back in the Old Testament to look at an ancient story of another hometown in disrepair. For the next 13 weeks, we're looking at the story of Nehemiah in a series called Hand Me Another Brick. And by the way, as I introduce the series... Here at FECG, we believe in something called faith at home. That simply means we believe the home is the spiritual training center of a family. Church is important. We come alongside. But the home is the spiritual training center of a family or a child. So we're making that possible for you as moms and dads who still have kids living at home by aligning all of our study curriculum, curriculi this summer. Our children and students are studying the same stuff that we are preaching about week by week here. So get out a Bible. Put it on your kitchen table. If it's a study Bible, all the better. And read the book of Nehemiah through the summer. It's only 13 chapters. We have 13 weeks in the summer. Read through it. Learn about it. And you can have discussions about what you're learning, what you're understanding, what you're not understanding about this ancient story and how it applies to our lives. Faith at Home hopes you'll take advantage of that this summer. Little historical background as we begin. I'll try to be brief. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah in our Old Testament were originally one historical book. They basically tell the story of what's called the Babylonian exile period of Jewish history. It took place about 2,600 years ago in the 6th century BC. Now it's a long time ago, but a lot of stuff happens during that century. Here are the high points. In roughly 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar becomes king of Babylon. He begins to expand his power. In 586, he takes, sends his armies to besiege Jerusalem. They destroy the city, break down the walls, loot the great temple of Solomon, and burn it with fire. They cart off thousands of Jewish families into captivity. And there's where we see stories like Daniel and the lion's den. Daniel's three friends in the fiery furnace. And then some 70 years after that, the Persians, under a ruler named Cyrus the Great, you can look him up in any secular history book, they conquer Babylon. But Cyrus, weirdly, is sympathetic to the Jews. We don't really know why, but he was sort of an early leader in human rights. He allows a Jewish man named Zerubbabel, you can read about him in Ezra, to return to Jerusalem with several hundred Jewish families to rebuild the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had broken down. And then, sometime after that, a man named Ezra is allowed to return to Jerusalem to bring God's law back to his people. So now they have a place to worship and they have God's law, but neither Ezra nor Zerubbabel is allowed to rebuild the walls of the city. Then comes the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a Jewish man born in exile, meaning he's lived his whole life in Babylon. He's never seen Jerusalem. But he rises to a rather significant position in the court of King Artaxerxes of Persia. He becomes the cupbearer to the king. We'll talk more about Artaxerxes in a couple of weeks. But simply put, 
In our modern world, this would be sort of like chief of staff for a, for a president or for a king. He's got a very influential position, privilege, and power. Let's begin the story. Just the first four verses of this ancient story of Nehemiah. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, now that was the ninth month of the Hebrew calendar, roughly equivalent to our November or December. In the 20th year, that's referring to the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, uh, I was in the citadel of Susa. Now, Susa is a city still today in western Iran, right on the border. Uh, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. So he's curious. He's never been to Jerusalem, but he's a Jew. He knows some Jews are living there. He knows the temple's been rebuilt, so he wonders, what's going on there? How are the people doing? They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now we're going to stop there for today. The first thing we see is Nehemiah's problem. Nehemiah's problem. Way back in 1982, I traveled to China with a basketball team called Sports Ambassadors. And while we were there, we visited the Great Wall of China. Anybody here ever have a chance to visit the Great Wall? At every service so far, there's been a few. Amazing sight, one of the seven wonders of the world, and for good reason. It took a thousand years to build. Uh, it took um, over, uh, they think over two million people died while it was being built. It's a very complicated construction. It stretches over 5,000 miles or longer. And contrary to a sort of urban legend, you can't see it from the moon. Some people say that, but you can't. It's still pretty big. It's up to 50 feet wide in many places. You can drive a car across it. It's up to 30 feet high, over 25,000 watchtowers along its full length. Now, what's interesting about the Great Wall of China is that it was built for protection along the northern edges of all these smaller kingdoms, and then it was joined together, but it didn't work. Uh, the guide who took us on our journey told us that when enemies from the north finally decided to invade, they didn't try to fight their way over the wall against the archers and soldiers and so forth. They just bribed the guards and walked right through the gate. So the Great Wall didn't work for that purpose, but it did become a symbol of a whole people group. The symbol of the strength and determination of the Chinese people, enormous symbolic value. In fact, the Chinese interpreter, the student who was with us on our trip, as we left the Great Wall, he leaned over to me and whispered in perfect English, he said, for me as a Chinese man to see the Great Wall, I think it's like you as an American Christian to see the second coming of Jesus Christ, he said. Powerful words. Amazing to me. Nehemiah is in a position of importance. And in this position, he hears word back from Jerusalem. Those who survived the exile or back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall has been broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Trouble and disgrace. Why? Well, to understand that, we have to understand the significance of walls in the ancient world. Like the Great Wall of China, walls of ancient Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern cities were both a necessity for protection, and they were highly symbolic as well. In fact, scholars still study the ruins of ancient walls dating back to even 10,000 years B.C. In fact, the Wall of Babylon, built by Nebuchadnezzar, is one of the great accomplishments of the ancient world. A wall some 380 feet thick at places and over 100 feet high. Massive, intimidating wall. And Nebuchadnezzar did that for a reason. So his people would consider their city safe, and so their people would know, his people would know that he, as their king, was very great. Because the wall served a practical purpose. You put archers on it, you could fight off enemies as they approached, but it also was a symbol of identity and strength. The greater the wall, the greater the security of the people. The greater the wall, the greater the reputation of the king. Ancient people would have thought of their wall kind of like we think of the Statue of Liberty or the American flag. High symbolic value. Now, it's interesting that in our modern world, we no longer build walls around our cities because warfare has changed. A wall doesn't help you against airplanes and, and, and air, air attack. So we don't build walls. But interestingly, personally... When we buy a home or you build your first home and you have a yard, what do we tend to do? We put a fence around our yard. We build a little mini wall to provide safety for our children, but also sort of to stake out what is ours. A friend told me here in church that recently he had a squabble with his neighbor lady because his shrubbery was hanging over the, her fence into her airspace. And that was her territory. So we do still kind of build walls. 
Now, we're going to, um, uh, beyond all that wall, beyond the wall of, of, of protection and so forth, the wall of Jerusalem carried the symbol of God's promise. In Psalm 51, we read, In your good pleasure make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. In other words, the wall represented to God's people the prosperity and blessing of God himself. So when Nehemiah hears the walls are still broken down after 100 years, he knows the people are in trouble because they're vulnerable. Vulnerable to attack, enemies could approach without any resistance. Vulnerable from within, as men could, uh, could hold them hostage to their own weakness. We'll learn more about that in the weeks ahead. And then Nehemiah also says, not only are they in trouble, they're in disgrace. Now that's a different kind of word. Trouble is one thing, disgrace is kind of another thing. The people were in disgrace because in those days, a city with no walls was regarded as inferior, insignificant, and weak. This is especially painful for the people of Israel who believed God had called them his chosen people and had promised to bless the whole world through them. So how could that happen if they had no wall? The people are in disgrace because it appears that their God does not exist or doesn't care enough or isn't strong enough to give them a wall. He has simply abandoned them. Or that's what others think. Now, let's pause there and try to jump from the ancient story of Nehemiah to our stories today. Not talking about physical walls around our cities or our fences around our yards, but about our lives. What about the invisible walls of our lives? There's an interesting verse in Proverbs chapter 25. It says, like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. I saw a story the other day, maybe you saw it as well, about a professional golfer named John Daly who recently admitted in an interview he had lost over $55 million gambling during the course of his professional golf career. Then he admitted that a lot of that was because of his on and off struggles with alcohol. And then he also admitted he's had three or four failed marriages. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say John Daly has lived most of his adult, male, um, adult life as a man without walls. I also think of a, of a friend of mine in college. Got to be friends our freshman year on our freshman floor. Toward the end of that year, uh, he began to uh, drink at parties on weekends. By the next year, he was drinking pretty much every weekend and a few weeknights as well in our room. By the third year, he had to drop out of school. He no longer could keep up with his classwork and needed treatment. He had become a young man living without walls. I think of married couples I've come to know over the years, husbands and wives who at one time have been deeply in love, but failed to build strong and stable walls around their marriages and eventually, some of those marriages crumbled and failed. A life, a marriage, a family without walls is a life, family, or marriage without foundations, without protection, without boundaries, out of control in some way, and in danger of all kinds of temptations and in danger and vulnerable to enemies. Spiritually speaking, it's a life without God's word. It's a life without God's protection. It's a life without God's presence. Jesus spoke about just such a life in Matthew chapter 7, he said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who builds his house on sand. The rain came down, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So, how strong are your spiritual walls? How firm are your foundations? We build the spiritual walls of our lives by reading, understanding, and applying the truth of God's Word to our lives and to our families. That's what faith at home is all about. We strengthen those walls through prayer and personal devotion. We fortify those walls by sharing worship and fellowship and service together as part of the church. And when our walls are strong and secure, we're prepared for almost any storm life may throw our way. And they do come. But if our foundations are shallow and our walls half built, then even the smallest of squalls is enough to threaten home, family, marriage, even faith itself. Nehemiah's problem is that he hears the walls of Jerusalem are broken down and the people are in trouble and disgrace. So what's his response? Second part today is Nehemiah's response. 
I wonder if you can remember, if you're old enough, where you were and what you were doing on 9-11. Most of us can remember, if we were old enough, what we were doing and where we were when we first saw the images or heard the word that the towers had fallen. Much like those of us who are old enough can remember the day JFK was assassinated. Traumatic cultural event for a people. 9-11 ended our sense of security as a people. It changed the way we think about airplanes, airports, skyscrapers, cities, our nation, even the world. But for most of us, 9-11 did not touch us directly. We sort of saw it from a distance. Still traumatic, but we saw it from a distance. But sooner or later, most of us, if we haven't already, will have such a defining moment ourselves, personally. A phone call comes in the middle of the night. The pink slip shows up on our desk. A note's left behind that we scarcely can understand. In short, something will happen that threatens the walls of our lives and we'll feel like everything is crumbling around us, so how will we respond? Here's Nehemiah's response. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah mourned. But why? Think about it. He serves in the court of one of the most powerful men on earth. He has a position of influence, privilege, and great wealth. Yet he mourns. Why? He mourns because his people, many of whom he's never even seen, are in trouble. He mourns because the people of God are in disgrace, because they're living in fear. They're being taken advantage of, of people who, who take advantage of their weakness. He mourns because his God, Yahweh, Jehovah, has been defied by Nebuchadnezzar some hundred years earlier, and even now is being ridiculed by those who no longer respected his glory and his holiness. Nehemiah mourns because he loves God, and he loves God's people, because we only mourn for that which we love. Isn't that true? In Luke 19.41, we're reminded how centuries later, Jesus would mourn himself over the city of Jerusalem. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build embankments against you and will encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus mourned over the people of Jerusalem because he loved them and he knew that spiritually speaking they were lost and without walls. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn. You may have wondered what he means by that. I think he means that we are blessed when our hearts break with that which breaks the heart of God. We are blessed when we love the things God loves. We are blessed when we care deeply about what God cares deeply about. So we must ask ourselves, what causes us to mourn? Nehemiah's personal situation, very good, very comfortable. Yet he mourned. Sometimes, if I'm honest, I was thinking about that this week. Sometimes if I'm honest, I, I fear that I sometimes care more about my personal situation, my personal convenience, than the fact that a neighbor or friend might not know or understand the gospel that I just take for granted every day. Sometimes I fear that I'm grieved more that my taxes are too high than that children go to bed hungry every night in our county, where we live. So, here's the question that the very first four verses of Nehemiah cause us to ask. Do our hearts break with the things that break the heart of God? And what about our own lives? Not just the world out there, but our own lives, our own relationships. Is there anything in our lives, in our hearts, that causes God to mourn? Ray Steadman, a pastor, once said, you will never rebuild the walls of your life until you first weep over the ruins. You'll never rebuild the walls of your life until you first weep over the ruins. Notice, Nehemiah mourns, but then he responds with fasting and prayer before the God of heaven. You know, sometimes we mourn, we lament the way things are, but we just complain. We just complain. We wish the economy was better. We wish our government was more efficient. We wish the Cubs had real baseball players. We just want to change. We want things to be better. We wish someone would do something about this. We're concerned about problems, but sometimes we forget. We neglect to turn that mourning into prayer and fasting. 
Nehemiah mourns, he sees something wrong, then he carries it to God in prayer and fasting. And now we also will pray, I understand that. Most Americans will pray. But often I think we go to God sort of asking him to do something about what we're concerned about. I don't think Nehemiah did that. I don't think Nehemiah went to God in fasting and prayer and said, God, this is not right. I've heard the, the city has broken down walls and the people are in disgrace. It's not right. Do something about it. I don't think he prayed that prayer. I think Nehemiah went to God and said, God, this is not right. What would you have me do about this? Jeff's going to get into Nehemiah's prayer more deeply next week. But there's a big difference between mourning a lousy situation and seeking God in your mourning. And there's a big difference between just asking God to do something about it and making yourself available to Him to be part of the solution. Big difference. Then in prayer, I think God gives Nehemiah a vision. Now, we're going to get a little bit ahead of ourselves today, but we have to. God gives Nehemiah a vision, a vision of a rebuilt wall for a city he's never seen, a vision of a new Jerusalem. And that vision produces a passion. And that passion, as you will see, produces action. But for today's purposes, it all begins with a broken heart. It all begins with a mourning. Now, in the course of my life as a pastor, and Bruce would say this, Jeff would say this, Roger would say this, all of us would say it, Sterling, we get the great privilege of hearing hundreds and hundreds of stories, life stories, many wonderful stories and many difficult stories. Some of those stories are of walls that are broken down and burned with fire. I've heard stories of marriages that began with great hope and ended in bitterness and despair. I've heard stories of addiction and promiscuity. I've heard stories of excess and debt. And painfully, some of those walls have yet to be rebuilt, still broken down. And yet, on the other hand, I've heard some stories for which the phrase burned with fire is too gentle. Stories that I thought had no chance whatsoever to ever be rebuilt. And despite my lack of faith and vision, I saw them being rebuilt right before my eyes. Stories, lives rebuilt slowly, relationships rebuilt slowly through confession, forgiveness, surrender, and great painstaking obedience. The walls and relationships rebuilt brick by brick by brick. See, here at the beginning of this ancient story, we see that Nehemiah reveals to us right off the bat that he serves a God that loves to rebuild broken walls. And we serve a God who loves to rebuild and restore broken things. And sometimes he uses us to do the rebuilding. Sometimes we sing a song here at West Campus, and I, if I thought about it ahead of time, we would have sung it today. But it's a song that includes these lyrics. To only my maker, my father, my savior, redeemer, restorer, rebuilder, rewarder, to only a God like you, I give my praise. I love those words. Our God is redeemer, restorer, rebuilder, rewarder. So as we close today, what about you? How are your walls today? The invisible spiritual walls of your personal life, your marriage, your family, are they strong and holding up to all the pressures and temptations the world has to bring? Or are there some places in those walls that, if you're honest, need a little work? Maybe there's a crumble here or there. Maybe as you sit here today, you can think of a place or two that have been burned down completely. And you think there's no hope that particular part of that wall can ever be rebuilt. But as this ancient story begins, we see a man who allows his heart to be broken with that which breaks the heart of God. And out of that brokenness, he cries out in prayer and fasting to the God of heaven. And he cries out, oh God, what would you have me do to rebuild those walls? Help me. May that be our prayer as well. I hope you'll stick us with us with this series. Get out your Bible, put it out at home, learn the story of Nehemiah and how it applies to your life.